chapter 3 is where our message will be this morning. The book of Colossians is really in two, divided in two sections. Chapter 1 and 2 is basically doctrinal. It shows what Christ has done. And chapter 3 and 4 is practical. It's what Christians should do. So Paul wrote this for the concern of the Colossians. For the Colossians church. As an encouragement to them. And he also prayed for them. And let me tell you this before we get into a read our scripture is that with all the temptation, uh, troubles that's going on in the world, it's easy to become distracted from what really matters to us, matters as far as living out our faith in Christ. Let's face it, life can be, can be crazy at times. With all the full uh, stuff that's going on in the world today, we have the pandemic, we have the, the, all this protest and, and shooting going on, all the mass shooting. You know, just last night alone, it was like four shooting up in Rochester. It's just insane things going on in our lives. It's no wonder why we sometimes lose sight of what's important. Sometimes we lose sight of Jesus easily, all because of the things that's going on around us. There is so much noise, society and culture telling us that you know there we are to. Uh, Make what you feel. Make what, what it goes. Uh, whatever you make you happy. Do whatever makes you happy. That's what this thing is. Or you got the other one where, um, where it says, be all you can be. Or be in control of your own destiny. That's what society and your culture tells us at every turn there is an opportunity to set your to to get lost in the chaos of what's going on around us not to mention get depressed over the general state of our country or general state of what's going on in our world and then you wonder, where's God in all of this? How do we stay focused spiritually? How do we concentrate on God amidst of all these craziness? There have been so many days that I've lied down to go to bed and realized that I have barely prayed at all or sought God guidance throughout the day about any decision I have made. Let me ask you a question. What is Jesus Christ to you? What is he to you? You know, some people might say that, well, he's, he's a part of my life, or he has a place in my life, or he's a big place in my life. Here's the thing. Jesus doesn't want a place in your life. Jesus doesn't want a big place in your life. Jesus doesn't want to be 
a part of your life. Jesus desire, deserve, and demand preeminence in your life. Now, does Christ have preeminence in your life? What is he to you? Does he have preeminence in your life? Does he have um, superiority in your life? You know, I've asked this same question myself. And I want you to look at the scripture this morning with that question in mind. Colossians chapter 3, we'll pick it up in verse... One. Colossians 3, verse 1. If he then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ seated on the right hand of God. Set your affection, your tent, your affection on things above, not on things on the earth, for he are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall he also appear with him in glory. Then skip down, if you will, to verse 11. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, nor circumcision nor uncircumcision, nor barbarian nor schism, Bound nor free, but Christ is all and in all. The grass withered, the flower faded, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Now, I want to talk to you this morning about this first. When Christ is in all, when Christ is in all, verse 11 said, Christ is all, all, A-L-L, all. Well, first, what does all mean? You've heard me say that before. Those of you who have heard me preach before, what does all mean? All means all, and that's all all means. So when Christ says, when Paul says he's in all, means he's in all. If Christ is in all, if Christ is all, then that really leaves room for what? Nothing. Nothing. This leaves nothing out. It means he's everything. So, is Jesus Christ all to you? What is he to you? I mean, is he all and is he in all? Well, Paul just said it a different way um, in verse 4 when he says, Christ is our life. Now, Jesus doesn't have, Jesus doesn't give life. He is our life. He's our life. Paul said that in, in uh, Philippians 121, for me to live is Christ. He is our life. He doesn't just point to life. He said that I am the way, the truth, and the life in John 14, 6. So Christ is our life. He is all and he is in all. Colossians 3, verse 1 to 4, lay down the requirements and the reason for living with an heavenly focus. That's the type of our message this today is adjusting your focus.
Colossians 3, 1 and 2 gives us two requirements for living with a spiritual focus. First, seek those things which are above. Seek those things which are above. First, verse 1. Look at verse 1. If he then be risen in Christ, seek those things which are above, which where Christ seated on the right hand of God. We have been crucified, my friend, with Christ. First of all, we have been crucified with Christ. Look at um, in verse 3, where it said, For he are dead. For he are dead. You know, you know right now you're looking at a dead person up here? You're looking at a dead man right in front of you this morning. I have been crucified with Christ the moment I said, Lord, save me. The moment I give my life to Christ, my own nature, my own ways is dead. And my friend, so are you. Now, let me clarify some things here. This letter that Paul wrote to the Colossi church is written to believers. Now, I'm speaking here to believers. Now, if you're here this morning and you don't know Christ as your Savior, if Christ is, you haven't been saved, I'll get to you later. But right now, I'm addressing the believers. Those that are accepting Jesus Christ as your Savior. I died with Christ the day I received him in my life. The old me died when I was buried in that water of baptism. This process is an act out in baptism based on our faith in Christ Jesus. See, the old sinful nature dies. That's being, that's being crucified. We are ready now to receive a new life. That's buried. When you go in the water, that's the um, simulation of the grave, being buried with Christ. Then Christ gives us a new life. That's the resurrection with Christ. That, my friend, that day when I was baptized, that was my funeral service. That was my funeral service. And you know what? The only mourner that was at that service was the devil and his, angel, and his, and his demons. That was the only mourner there. Why? Oh, he hated to see his buddy. He hated to see his buddy like gone like that. He had to see his buddy die. But I gave my life to Christ. My life is now his. But not only have we been crucified with Christ, we have been raised with Christ. And not only are we dead, but according to this batch of scripture, we have been raised. Look at it again in verse 1. If he then be raised and be risen with Christ, we are dead in him and we are risen with him. 1 Corinthians 15, 4 says, And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain. Our faith is also vain. Christianity stands and falls on the historical fact, the theological significance that Christ risen from the dead. That's where it stands. The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is the most um, amazing fact in history. But just as amazing is that 
every person who trusts in Jesus Christ can what? Can trust in him. Can believe in him. You were dead in your trespass and sin. You are separated from God. You are unable to respond with, to God's will, which will doom you to eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angel. But when you, when you are in, in the declared righteous, when you are declared righteous, by faith alone, through Christ alone, you are risen with Christ. You are born again. What are the things that above we are to be seeking? What is it about heaven that makes heaven um, makes it so attractive to you? Christians look forward to heaven as a place for reward. Reward for our faithfulness to God. Reunion with our believing loved ones. And rest from the troubles of this world. Is that what heaven means to you? My friend, Heaven, rest assured, is a glorious place. We look forward to heaven not just because of a reward, not just because our loved ones is there, but my friend, you misunderstood what heaven is all about if your view of heaven doesn't go any further than those things. The focus of the believers, heaven, the focus of heaven is supposed to be, it should be, and it is Jesus Christ himself. Verse 1 said, If he then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ seated on the right hand of God. Christ is heaven's focus. Paul says that heaven is where Christ is. Our passion for heaven ought not to be merely about the fact that your mommy and daddy is going to be there. Or you ought to be passionate about the fact that you have a savior there. In fact, if your loved ones was saved, uh, you would really dishonor Christ if you spend too much time mourning their death. Psalm 1611 says, Thou wilt show me the path of life in thy present is fullness of joy. At the right hand of there are pleasure evermore. So if your loved ones had passed on, if there was in Christ, if they're in the Lord, they are presently experiencing joy you and I can never imagine. So don't spend too much time mourning for them. Instead, make sure you're on your way to the place where Christ is. Some people wonder if, 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 if heaven is going to be a born place. How many times have we heard that before? Well, I believe it's only going to be born to those who see Christ as a born person. But if you know, if you trust, if you love, if you worship, and if you serve him, oh, 
Evan can't wait. You know, like the whole hymn says, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and What you seek, my friend, is your ambition. Your ambition is to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, Matthew 6, verse 33. Seek first the kingdom of God. Satan doesn't care what on earth you may seek. As long as you don't see those things that are above, don't seek that. You don't like that. Verse 1 says, Heaven is where Christ is seated on the right hand of God. This statement shows Christ in two sovereign positions. First, it shows Christ seated according to uh, Hebrew chapter 10. In verse 11, teaches that the, the superiority of, of the priesthood of Christ. And see, in the Old Testament, the high priest would the high priest would um, would would make sacrifices for the people every year. And there wouldn't be uh, he would never rest from this task at all. And, and the thing is, when you look at Christ, where is he now? He's seated on the right hand of the Father. He's seated. He's seated. He's seated right now as our all-sufficient prophet, priest, and king. But notice where he's seated. He's seated at the right hand. Right hand of God. The right hand is a place of, is a place of honor. It's a place of, of, of power. It's a place of majesty. The right hand of God is a place of, of, of victory. A sovereign authority. In Psalms 110, verse 1, David says, the Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at the right hand until I make thine enemy thy footstool. Heaven is, is not just a place where Christ resides. It is a place where Christ reigns. So to seek, to seek those things that are above means to seek, means to live in submission to the lordship that are in Christ, the Lordship of Jesus. Christ is in every area of our lives. Christ reigns in heaven. And if you seek those things that are, that are above, you, you will reign in your life and bring to pass all the good pleasure of your life. On earth. You know, a lot of times you hear the word, uh, the phrase, you're so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. My friend, when you, you focus your attention on, 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 on heaven and on Lord, the Lord will, 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 will enrich you to serve and will enrich you to reach out to other people. The first requirement is to seek those things that are above. Second requirement is to set your, your affection on things above. The Lord commands us to, 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 to guard our thoughts away from something and, and, and to something. Verse 2 said, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. The way to, this, this means that to look at life from God's perspective 
and not to seek what he and to seek that what he desire. The way to seek him is to set your affection, to set your mind, to set your thought. The, 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 the word affection really means, means attention, to set your attention. That is what Paul's, well, you, you see what Paul seek here is to have, to set your mind. Because the Bible says that as a man think it, so is he. Proverbs 23. So who says that you can't, you can't control your thought? You cannot, you know, that's nonsense. You can control your thought. You can set your mind. You can, you, you can think of things that are, that are profitable to your mind. You know, the, there's a, uh, an article in the paper a while back. I remember how, how, how far back it goes, but there was a report that estimated that um, between 60,000 and 80,000 times a day, thoughts go through our mind. Between 60 and 80,000 times a day, we think of things. That's what, uh, 23 to 33,000? No, 25 to 33,000, 20, 2,300 times per minute, per hour, right? I'm not good at math. I think it's like 23 hours per minute. Yeah. Still, that's a lot to put your mind through. So you can control your thought. You can control your mind. So who said you can't control it? Who said you can't think of it? You can set your mind. You can set your mind on things of uh, You set your mind on finding a mate. You set your mind on finding uh, a better job. You set your mind on starting a family. You set your mind on establishing a better career. You set your mind on completing your education. You set your mind on reaching your goal. So the issue is not whether or not you can set your mind. The question is what you set your mind on. Turn me to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. See, Jesus is to um, dominate our attention. I, I'm, I'm, to, I'm, to, I'm to meditate on him. I'm, I'm to set my mind on him. I, I, and there, there, are, there, are, there are many things pulling my mind in different direction. You, and, and, and yours as well, I'm sure. But, but the thing is, we are not to set our mind on the temporal things. We're supposed to set our mind on the eternal things of heaven. Romans 12, verse 1 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that he present your body a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. But this is a call, this call is to the consecrated lifestyle. Depends on the development of a consecrated mindset. So Romans 12, 2 says, says this, look at verse 2, says, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that he may prove that which is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Well, well how do we set our mind on things above? The Bible says, keep your mind with all diligent for out of it are the issues of life, Proverbs 4. Set your mind. You, you, thou shalt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee 
because he trusted in thee. Isaiah 26, verse 3. And, and set your mind on things above by reading, by, by, by hearing, by studying, by memorizing, by, by meditation on the word of God. You have heard me say this before in Isaiah 40, verse 8. The grass withered, the flower faded, but the word of our God, this living word, shall stand forever. We are given the requirements and now the reason. What are the reasons? The reasons for heaven and heavenly, heavenly focus. Reason to adjust in our focus. Colossians verse 3 to 4 gives us three reasons for living with an heavenly focus. Three reasons I want to give you. First of all, the debt of the old life. The debt of the old life. Verse 3 says, for you're dead. This means that we should have little desire for this world as a dead man, dead person has. What desire does that person have for this world? None. The Christian's life, the Christian's life, the real home, is where Christ lives, according to John 14. Before Christ saves us, you were spiritually dead, according to Ephesians 1. Uh, 2 1 said, For he have been quickened, that means made alive, who were dead in trespassing and sin. Now, understand me clearly, that doesn't mean we're not supposed to um, disregard our, our fellow man. We're not supposed to walk around with blinders on, looking at this happening up in heaven a lot. You're not supposed to, you know, just, just be totally focused on heaven and disregard our relationship with our family, disregard our relationship with our spouses, disregard our relationship with our, with our peers. No. We're supposed to keep, just like driving a bike, you know, of a, of a, one of those box trucks, you know, pull out in front of you, and your, your nature was to go right up on top of them, you know, right behind them. You know, it's like, oh, you're angry, frustrated. Rather than stepping back, dropping back, so you can see around them, you see surrounding, you're right up on top of them, man. It's like, it's like driving like this. Yeah, frustrate me. No, step back so you can see around them. And then you know they're clear to go around. You can see things. We're not called to be a, a, a secret service Christian, undercover agent. No. Set your mind and things of all. We all, all nature died. Little desire for this world, but still reach out. You see, when you receive Christ, your spiritual condition is miraculously transformed. You were dead in sin. You became alive to sin. You can see sin. You know what's sin. That's what Paul means when he says that he are dead. In Romans 6, 1, states that Paul's question about Christian living. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin? That grace may abound? And look what his answer is in verse 2. He answered, God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Later, he continues in verse 11. It says, Likewise reckon he also yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. If you have been born again, you have died to sin. Christ has canceled your path. Change your position, conquered your problem, therefore you can and should live through as though live as though you were dead 
to sin and alive to God in Jesus Christ. Paul gives us practical way to do this in Galatians chapter 6, verse 14. It says, But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Boast in the cross, my friend. Boast in the cross what God has done for you. Boast, brag about what Jesus did for you when he shed his blood on the cross. Not, do not put your confidence in anything but the cross. Jeremiah 9.23 says, Thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might, let not the rich glory in his riches. Boast only, only in the cross of Jesus Christ by which you die to sin. First reason was to death of the old man. Second reason, my new secure position. I have a new secure position. Look in verse 3. For ye are dead. And your life is hid in Christ Jesus. Hid with Christ in God. The fact that your life is hid with Christ in God means that, that, that the non-Christian will never, will, will, will never truly understand your devotion to Christ. They won't understand why you're here this morning. They won't understand why you walk by faith. You love without condition. You give generously. They they won't understand your rejection of this world. 1 Corinthians um, 2.14 says, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither... Can he know him, know them, because they are spiritually discerned? So don't expect most people to to prove your understanding, your devotion to follow, your decision to follow Christ. It all seems silly to them. To say that your life is hid with, with, with Christ It's hid just to say that your salvation is safe. Your salvation is secure. Our salvation is eternally secure because our life is hidden with Christ in God. Now, in order for Satan to get to me, he would have to he would have to go through God the Father. He would have to go through God the Son to get to me. I ain't, I'm here to tell you, it ain't happening. It ain't going to happen. My position is secure. For him to get to me is impossible. John 10, 28 said, And I give on, and I gave unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither, neither shall any man pluck them out of my father's hand, out of my hand. My father, which gave me them, gave me, gave them me, is greater than all. No man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. Hey, I and my father are one. You may ask, can you lose your salvation? Well, the answer is that, to that is simple. It all depends. It all depends on who save you. Who save you? 
If your hope of eternal life is based on your, 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 your self-righteousness, your, your good work, your, 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 your self of well-being, you're, you're, you are destined to hell. If you base those on that, you are destined to hell. But if your hope is on heaven, rest in, hope of heaven, rest in on the fact that, that Jesus Christ died for your sin and is Lord in your life, you are confidently, you can definitely sing, you can, without a shadow of a doubt, sing, Oh, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a fortress, glory divine. Here of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. Oh, what a song. First reason. Debt of the old self. Second reason. Oh, secure, secure position. Third reason, the glory, hope of glory. Verse four, I'm almost done. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall we also appear with him in glory. This verse makes three declarations about the believer's hope of glory. First, Christ is our life. Christ is our life. If Christ has, has no place in your life, you are lost in your sin. You are lost and going to hell. Point blank. Point simple. I can't make an innocent simpler than that. If Christ has no part in your life, you are destined to hell. I didn't say it, the Bible did. For those who have put their, have been born again and put their trust in Jesus Christ, Christ is not just an important part of your life, he is your life. Galatians 2 says, For I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth within me. And the faith that I now live by the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. In Philippians 121, Paul testifies that for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. 1 John 5.12 says, He that had the Son had life, and he that had not the Son had not life. Let me ask you a question. What is your life? I asked a question before the top of message. What is your life? What are you living for? What is it that you can't live without? My friend, I encourage you to examine yourself, examine your heart today, and determine what is your life? What is life for to you? The second is the coming of Jesus Christ. Paul says that when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, note that he didn't say if Christ appear, he says when Christ is coming again, my friend. We don't know when, we don't know the time, we don't know the hour, he's coming. Mark 13, 32 said, but of that day and that hour knoweth no man no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. We don't know when he's coming, but we can know the, with absolute confidence that Jesus Christ is coming again. The Lord promised it. The angel proclaimed it. The, the word declared it. The Spirit affirmed it. And the Bible 
teaches it and a Christian believe it. And you know what? All the saints and redeemed, they expect it. 1 Thessalonians 4.16 says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with a, with a voice of the archangel, and the, the trumpet of God, and the trump of God, with the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall caught up with him, together with them in the air, in the cloud, to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we forever be with the Lord. Jesus is coming again, my friend. And the third is this, is that our future glory, our future glory, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall we appear with him in glory. Your life is hidden in with Christ in God for now. For now. One day the mystery shall be revealed. First John three two said first John three two said beloved now are we the Son of God and does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. If you want to truly have a heavenly focus, adjusted focus, seek, set your mind. Seek the things above. Set your mind on things above. As a Christ followers, we need to stay focused on truth. We need to focus on Jesus Christ. We, you can remain faithful and full of hope, no matter what's going on around you. How do we do it? Stay focused? By ordering our very lives around, around him. But it isn't, it isn't, it won't be a, a one and done type of thing. It's going to be continual. It gets continual. It's, it's something you need to work on each and every day, committing your life each and every day to. Adjusting to Bible study. Adjusting to meditation. Adjusting to the Word of God every single day. You've got to be in it. You've got to talk to the Lord. You've got to pray. Adjusting your prayer life. Scripture testify of me, Christ says. So you got to be in it. you got to be in it. Tweaking those things. What small changes will you make today? You know, I, we used to have a, um, a German shepherd. I dropped the mic. German shepherd dog. And it was a beautiful dog. And one of the things that I taught, taught her was how to um, stay still. And one of the things that I, um, I do is that I'll take a, she loved this, um, this speed of meat um, I get from the, the dog, I forget what the name of the meat was, but I would take that piece of meat and she would ever sit, she'd sit and look at me, and I would come down and say, okay, look at it, stay, stay. And I put it down. And all her time, her eyes are fixed on me. Her eyes looking at me. I put it down. She never looked at the meat. She knows there. I put it down. And she's looking at me. I said, stay. Stay. And I backed up. I walked away. And she's all the time looking at me. I said, go. And she, boom, got that thing. Her victory comes by looking at me, by watching me. We ought to be fixing our eyes on Jesus Christ. Always got to fix our eyes on heaven, Jesus Christ. You can see perfect vision, what's going on around you, but you got to be sure you focus on him. Amen? Amen. Amen. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. 
Thank you, O Lord, for your presence with you here this morning. We ask that you would look down upon us today, Lord, and just um, be with each and every one of us. Lord, may your word not just a hearsay today, but Lord, may it resonate in our heart. May it be an application to where we can live out our hope that is found in us. That you are our Savior. That you are our Redeemer. May that be true in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.